John Rob, hello. Hi, you're right, yeah. I wanted to talk about Northern bands, and because uh, I know you've written a lot of books on the history of Manchester music and Stone Rose and stuff. What is it about Manchester uh, to start off with, and, and why is there so many great bands hailing from there? There's so many different little factors in that. It's, um, I think uh, for modern bands, it's because they had their head start at the punk thing when the Pistols played there in '76. It wasn't the first time they played outside London. But it was, um, it, was a, it was kind of one that had the right people at the gig. So several people that gig went on to do stuff. And, uh, so, so, but it also had a musical uh, history before that, obviously, like every city's got a musical history. But in the 1960s, it had quite a big music scene then. Famously, it had the whole top five of the American charts in 1965, with groups like Herman's Hermits. So there was like, um, there was an inf infrastructure there. There was, there was venues, there was PAs, all those things you needed at that time to make music happen. So there's a space to make things happen. It was a big college town as well. I think that's really important. It was then, it's even bigger now. So there's thousands of students coming in. That's a lot of young people coming into the town. But the question is, why is, why is that not happening on a smaller scale like a place like Huddersfield? You know, why is it particular to Manchester? It's also a media city. It had Granada there as well. So I had, so like Tony Wilson was making a very good program time called So It Goes with Pistol's first TV appearances on that. So it's, it's always kind of all facts in there. There's also there's all the longer term theories as well, like um, the history of the city, the revolutionary cities, the 19th century. People, it was, you know, suffragettes came out of Manchester, like the well, big call the movie came out of Manchester. Um, Karl Marx went to Manchester because he thought the revolution was going to happen there. There's all this kind of stuff, and you know, the Peterloo massacre. So it had a revolutionary aspect. But I, I always like to think uh, this is probably a bit too esoteric, but. By the 1970s, the, the revolution has sort of turned, not from revolution, but into making revolutionary music in a sense. It's just part of the um, kind of attitude that comes out of the town. So it was, uh, so instead of instead of fighting back the government, they were just making records that were just more off the wall. There's, a, there's definitely attitude also in the city of, because um, it's a city that got built up, up, it's a modern city, it's an industrial, first industrial city in the world, first post-industrial city, because all the industry collapsed. So there was a thing about pulling yourself up, you know, so if you're in a band, you've got to go to the top. That was always very Manchester. Whereas Liverpool bands of that period where they're brilliant, amazing musicians, but their thing just be a great musician. Whereas Manchester bands were ambitious, you know. So there's all that in there, all mixed together. And it had a certain kind of infrastructure and organisation, which is important. And it had a clutch of about five really brilliant bands, you know, like Joy Division, like Incredible Buzzcocks were incredible. Buzzcocks took punk outside London, first outside London punk band. That was important, that, you know, they made it's their first single, Spar Scratch EP, a DIY record, they made it themselves. And that was really influential as well. It made, gave people the idea to make their own records. So it's all going on in Manchester. You know, I even had music journalists living in Manchester at the time as well, which no other city had. Liverpool had one, and I think Manchester had about four or five. Leeds had none. So that's always the thing that I see, you have to compare Leeds to Manchester because they've both got very, not totally similar histories, but in ways of making bands and scenes. There's not much difference in why one city and not the other, because Leeds is erratic for music. It has good band, 10 year gap, good bands, whereas Manchester's just consistent. Well, I think one, once you start getting bands coming out of the city, everyone moves to the city, then it gets confidence, and Manchester just kept rolling and rolling and rolling. So by about 81, 82, it's, you know, with, with the vision of people like Wilson, you know, Tony putting in the Hacienda and that, which wasn't like that big a club at the time, but it's, you know, people didn't go to that much. But, but it's a hell of a thing to have in a city, the biggest nightclub in Britain, in Manchester. So it gave Manchester a certain confidence that. And then, then bands like Smiths came out, very much they came out of that punk scene. Punk was, was definitely the driver of this early stuff. Even the Stone Roses came out of punk as well, you know. I mean, I, I would have the argument that they're the last punk band to make it in a sense. I mean, they're not directly what people think of being punk, but they came out of punk, they grew up punk. So by the time they made it, they turned into something else, but they were definitely sparked by the punk thing. They're probably the last band of that generation to make it really massive. So punk was really important in Manchester. It made a big difference. It sparked a lot of people into action. How have um, bands in Manchester sort of, and, and the music scene in Manchester changed from the, the early days of punk to the Manchester era and to now as well? You could. I think initially in punk they were, they were like Buzzcocks who was sort of punk band but different they're, they're arty they had a little twist to it yeah. then you go Joy Division uh, Factory which is very kind of post-punk post-punk came out of Manchester it was Manchester's take on punk it was very northern Joy Division can't come from anywhere else apart from Manchester the gloominess and the melancholy of, it was so part of the rainy weather and the mills it was a battered city then they do soundtrack it's, it's corny but if you put their music against footage of Manchester at the time it fits perfectly 
Um, but then you kind of go to the Smiths, who were trying to do something opposite to Joy Vision, but in a sense still have that melancholy mix into their music. Then you go Rose's Mondays, where, it, where it's post acid house, and you know, Marshall had a head start there with the Hacienda and with people like Mike Pickering, who's like a really important DJ, who's playing that stuff really early on. And a big club space got taken over by the youth, as you turn it into like this complete new kind of scene. Um, the Rose and Monday were a reflection on that, but they weren't directly that kind of music. Because people always say, oh, they're like acid house bands, they never play anything remotely sound like acid house. There's a couple of mixes that may have an acid house edge to them, but they were kind of traditional bands in a sense. The Roses were a super traditional, jangly 60s guitar, psychedelic bands, but they wrote these amazing songs, really anthemic. And they, had, they really catch that spirit that the music was for everybody. It was, um, you know, it wasn't like the leads on the stage and the crowd were like uh, the surfs. It was like the music went to the back, back of the room was for everybody, you know, which is a very acid house feeling. The idea that raves, you know, everyone was a star in a rave sort of thing. Happy Monday is probably close to the culture because they're the ones that first did the ease and stuff. I mean, those two bands really. They, they kind of explained Acid House back to the indie kids. That's what they, you know, because indie kids knew it was a party going on, but were too scared to go to it. But those bands opened up that party to a whole different raft of people, and then that became defining benchmark what Manchester music was. So after that, there's like a million different versions of bands that were really like them or really not like them. So it's always an ongoing argument. Well, people hate them, all those bands in the past, so. but it became a city that people go to for gigs. You know, I think one of the key things about Manchester is in the middle of loads of other cities, isn't it? Leeds is just down the road, up is down the road. All Lancashire's above. It's, it's catchment area about eight million people. They're going in and out of town for gigs and music and playing in bands. It's, and in the end, you've got to find three or four people who can play in a band. Good out of all those many people. So you talked about Factory Records already and Tony Wilson stuff, but. Could Manchester music scene not be the same without Tony Wilson? Well, it'd be different, yeah. but it would not it would it definitely still exist. I mean, he wasn't like... I mean, his part of the Smith stories doesn't exist. I mean, Oasis, he doesn't really exist in that story. I mean, Noel Gallagher took his uh, Oasis demo down to Factory, and the person, the Factory and A&R a person turned them down and said they weren't good enough, you know, I've so... That story before. Yeah, 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 Noel's quite fond of telling that story. <laughs> so, they... they they had to go to creation, you know, because they couldn't, because their own local label wouldn't sign them. And then Factory signed all these really rubbish bands. It is the end of Factory. Yeah. And they were signing these bands that nobody liked because because I, I think they'd lost their ears at that point. I think every record label has a moment where it's totally on it. And then after that, you, you, you might say, you might be signing stuff which you really like, which is what you should always do, but nobody else might like it. And that was their problem. So, yeah, so, so he went to creation. And, and Smith had already gone to Rough Trade. Smith didn't want to sign to Manchester label anyway. They didn't like Factory. They wanted nothing to do with Factory. So in a sense, they were a reaction to Factory. I think people in Manchester didn't like the idea that Factory was this was a dominant label and the city was defining the city's culture and that Tony was a spokesperson for the whole city because it, as brilliant as he was a spokesperson, he wasn't speaking for everybody who lived there, you know. He's very good at speaking about stuff, but Manchester never had one leader. It doesn't have leaders. It's not that kind of city, you know. Everybody's everybody's got a voice in Manchester, and that's why I guess that's why it's a really good music scene. It's perceived on the outside as being Tony Wilson speaking on behalf of everybody. And one of the greatest things about Tony, God bless him, is he didn't actually know very much about music.